Thanks for attending our, the webinar on laparoscopic adrenalectomy. Uh, we have three presenters today, Drs. Mayhew, Leo, and Singh, and they're each going to present their portion of the webinar, and we'll have a little bit of question and answer after. So if you have questions, go ahead and type them in the Q&A section. For the first portion, I'm happy to introduce Dr. Phil Mayhew. He's a professor of small animal and minimally invasive surgery at UC Davis. And today he's presenting tips, tricks, and troubleshooting during laparoscopic adrenalectomy. All right. Thanks very much, Kelly. Um, I will bring my screen up here. And you guys will shout out if uh, you're not seeing anything. It doesn't look like my mouse is showing up. So uh, if I really want to point something out on the video, I'll try and uh, I'll just escape out of here and do it that way. Maybe it'll work. Um, all right. So when we talked about what to do with this, uh, I don't have a lot of time. So I'm going to sort of steam through this uh, fairly quickly. And, and what I decided to do was sort of just... Think about, you know, what I've learned. I think I looked back and I did my first one of these in 2007. Uh, time flies, I guess. Um, and, uh, you know, what I wanted to do was look back and sort of think about the, the tips and tricks that would maybe allow this group, which is a group of very advanced surgeons who are um, eager to try new things, try and skip over some of the learning curve stuff that maybe I went through. And uh, I think, you know, I'm always excited when I can leapfrog certain um, errors and, and uh, certain steps in my learning curve. So um, that's sort of the way I've done it. And I'm, I picked out certain areas. So I'm not gonna give you a big sort of overarching lecture on this. Um, and the areas I picked out Positions and ports, uh, what I've learned over, over time, optimizing telescope port. Uh, I'm a big fan of, um, of uh, needlescopic fourth ports now. I'll show you what I'm talking about that. Touch on single port. Approach and hemostasis, you know, we've got a lot of different energy choices in surgery, and certainly we need energy choices for lap adrenalectomy. I wouldn't like to try one of these without a good uh, vessel sealer, but there are other things you can uh, use as well. We'll talk a little bit about J-hook, um, which uh, uh, I use a lot in these procedures. Talk a little bit about, little bit about complications, uh, bleeding being the big one, but a few other things that we've seen over the years, um, you know, and talk about the sort of psychology of conversion a little bit. You know, it's, a, it's sort of an interesting subject to think about. Um, I'm, I may be guilty of uh, not converting uh, soon enough on some of these cases. But of course, as experience grows, you know, the idea would be that we would try and um, get our conversion rate down, not to say that conversion is not a valuable tool. You know, we always talk about how conversion is a, a sign of good surgical judgment. But over time, if we can avoid the things that lead to conversion, like poor visualization and bleeding and so on and so forth, um, <coughs> uh, I think that's going to help us out. And, and it's going to give a higher proportion of our patients the chance to benefit from the advantages of this procedure. And then we'll talk a little bit about case selection um, at the end as well. I'll show you a couple of examples that are perhaps interesting conundrums that, um, uh, that you might come across. All right, so what about um, positioning of the patient, poor placement, a couple of different choices there. You know, I'm a big fan of the lateral oblique kind of position. I put my dogs, uh, like you can see in the bottom left-hand corner, um, I have our text um, um, uh, tie back that non-dependent limb to start with, just to give us enough access to the contralateral side so that we can drape our patient for a celiotomy should conversion be necessary. And then what I do is I usually let that leg fall down. Uh, once the drapes are on, uh, I have someone go under the drape and just release that tape. And then we start tilting that table over so that we're in a sort of a semi-sternal lateral oblique position, but a position that still allows me to convert to celiotomy which uh, I like to do for conversion. They, obviously you can um, convert to paracostal. Um, it's not that big of a deal, but uh, I prefer to convert to ciliotomy. The sternal uh, positioning was described by the group out of uh, Utrecht and Georgia. Um, and obviously the big advantage to that is that things tend to fall down. Other organs tend to fall down away from you. So you should have a clearer, clearer surgical field. Um, the only downside is that you can't easily convert to a ciliotomy. So I haven't gone to that position for this particular procedure um, just yet. One thing I want to point out about telescope position is um, that I generally always go up straight lateral from the umbilicus. So, uh, you know, the first couple of these I tried, I put the camera port in at a traditional sub umbilical position, didn't love it, spoke to Gilles Dupre at one of the meetings, he's like, no way, you got to go up the, up the abdominal wall a little bit three to five centimeters, usually something like that, because you wanna be looking down on the adrenal, maybe at 45 degrees, something like that. Don't go too high up the abdominal wall because then your scope's gonna be very vertical on the adrenal tumor. And that will lead to a lot of fatigue because you'll be standing there with your arms raised the whole time for an hour or two in there. It gets very, very tiring. 
The other thing I've learned over the years is um, put, put that scope directly lateral from the umbilicus. Obviously, we've got lots of different breeds, lots of different body types, long abdomens, short abdomens. Uh, and when you get that dog on the table in that position, sometimes it'll seem to you a little weird to put it directly lateral to the umbilicus. But in my experience, that's the, that's the way you get that straight on view of the adrenal tumor that you want. So here's an example of one where, you know, I would probably not accept this as a good telescope portal at the start of the procedure. So here I am and I've got, you can see I'm coming from kind of caudal. I get a glimpse of that adrenal tumor, but he's kind of around the corner there. Obviously I can adapt a little bit. If I have a 30 degree scope, I can sort of look sideways and maybe overcome that a little bit, but I'm a big fan of getting yourself set up for this surgery in an optimal fashion with good visualization, things in the right place at the beginning so that you don't work away for half an hour in a compromised fashion and regret it after a while. So with me, this one, I would probably take this telescope out or maybe I'd use this port as an instrument port and I would um, take the trouble to put a port in lateral usually to the umbilicus, but something that's looking straight onto that adrenal tumor, not where I'm constantly working around that cranial pole of the kidney, if that makes sense. Um, one thing that I, I'm not shy about these days, you know, I think you have to be careful not to sort of have that macho thing where you want to say, oh, I did it with so few ports and it was great and everything. I'm actually a big fan of putting a fourth port in these guys now. I'm lucky. It's a little bit of an ivory tower thing, but we, we have a needle scopic set now, which is a two millimeter set. Those ports are absolutely tiny okay and you don't have to close them they don't really cause any pain or scarring in people uh, so they're basically freebie ports um, and uh, you know this is uh, a little tiny graphite port from Storz it goes in over the top of the kidney and I mainly use those on left-sided adrenal masses just to retract the kidney away because we get a lot of what I call floppy left kidney syndrome where that kidney falls down onto the mass this is a cat you can see here this is a dog here. Again, that little two millimeter retractor can make the world of difference in your visualization, especially with those tricky caudal pole tumors that are where you've got a tricky little vascular dissection. You can see that renal vein draped over that caudal pole tumor there. And it makes all the difference for me to have an assistant pull back that kidney um, to, to, to allow me to see my surgical feel better. And as I go through more videos, you'll see other examples where I really could have used that needle scopic port. Sometimes I, don't, uh, I forget about it uh, and I don't think to use it. And other, you know, in my earlier uh, part of my learning experience, um, you know, I, I didn't think to put that in, but, but I, I don't hesitate to put that little fourth port in these days uh, to get a little bit of retraction on there. Single port adrenalectomy, you know, this was just described, Eric Monet just published a paper, I don't know if Eric's on here or not, he can definitely comment himself uh, at some point. Um, he published a paper with a number of these and he's a big fan of the SILS port. I tried the SILS in two or three adrenalectomies and I must say, I didn't love it. Um, but, you know, the great thing about the SILS uh, it's really easy to place. You don't get a lot of leakage of gas. It's, it's easy to put in. It's easy to take the specimen out of that defect because it's a larger defect. The big thing that you lose with that is triangulation. And so in a lot of the, uh, in the cases that I did, I always had to add at least one port or two ports to try and get that triangulation because you need to be coming at those vascular planes in a certain trajectory. Okay. And so for me, that wasn't a huge advantage, but that's very much, I think the single port thing is very much a um, user dependent and experience dependent. And I think as you build up your experience, you get better and better at it. Um, but for me, I went back to multi-port approaches for this because I, I just prefer that. It's just a, an opinion thing, really. All right. So how do you approach these? Now, I don't, I'm not a big fan of making a prescriptive approach to adrenal uh, surgery, but I do tend to do the basic introductory steps uh, in a similar sort of way. So on a left-sided tumor, what I'm going to do is I'm always going to initiate my peritoneal incision, just my peritoneal incision. It usually runs down like this. So I'm going to come down between adrenal mass and kidney, and then I'm going to do that, the sort of uh, second part of that inverted L that's going to go along the cable plane. The point I'm making here is go through your, your peritoneum initially, because if not, you, you sort of find yourself constantly fighting it, or at least I do. And I can't, I'm not going to be able to push my kidney away or push the fat down to see my renal vein and my cava while any of that peritoneum is intact. And I sometimes find that it's helpful to actually come through more of the peritoneum than you strictly need. And what, what I mean by that is sometimes I'm going to be taking that peritoneum all the way back to the re renal hilus and then going all the way around the front of the tumor. Uh, because only until I've done that will I be able to retract things away from my adrenal tumor. And that's all part of the process of getting yourself good visualization 
visualization because one of the biggest reasons for conversion is is when people don't um, have good visualization they get frustrated um, and you sort of say well I just I'm not getting this job done it's not progressing so I, I'm gonna I'm gonna quit here so that's one of the big things that I do similar sort of thing on the right hand side I'll usually do an L-shaped peritoneal incision where I'll come down between the adrenal mass and the kidney and then I'll go uh, the bottom part of the L is going along between the renal mass uh, between the adrenal mass and the cable plane that's usually the way uh, the way that I'm going to do it okay um, and then what I do is if I have one of those cases where sorry where I have um, a lot of fat or a very oozy kind of dog and a lot of other organs kind of coming down at me. That's not always the case. Sometimes you get a nice one in a thin animal and the, the mass presents itself very nicely for you and you don't have to do a lot of fighting through fat and stuff. But there are a lot of cases where there's a, quite a bit of fat around there. And what I sort of do, at least psychologically in my head, after I've done that initial peritoneal incision is I'll sort of think about what can I do to clean up these dissection planes to make this visualization situation a little better for me. And one of the things that works brilliantly in cats, it doesn't work quite as well in dogs. And meat, I don't want to step on your territory here talking about cats, but I had the, a better video of a cat one. And, and, you know, you can, in cats, the fat actually aspirates really, really easily um, with suction. And so what I'll do is I'll just go, I'll go around the mass and I'll just sort of suction away the fat as much as possible. I must say this doesn't work that great in dogs. It doesn't work as well in dogs. I have had some dogs which worked fairly well with the suction, uh, but I don't know if it, what it is about the, the fat of dogs, whether it's a little more fibrousy or whatever, but it doesn't tend to aspirate quite as well. But I'll often do that. I'll spend a few minutes with my suction. I use the trumpet valve from Storts. Uh, you know, you always want to apply very short, sharp bursts of suction because you don't want to have, uh, you don't want to aspirate out all of your pneumoperitoneum, right? Very short, sharp bursts, work your way around. And that can really help clean up your visual field. And, and that can really help find your renal vein and your cava in a, a relatively traumatic way. And so that's sort of the, the sort of second step that, that I usually uh, go through, at least psychologically. And then we need some dissection tools, right? We've got energy devices, we can use blunt dissection, a lot of different things, okay? But if we have the wrong tools, it can uh, be challenging. This is a video from years ago, one of my early cases. It's a bit of a bomb site in there, uh, as you can see. And I'm using a ligature tip here and I'm trying to separate renal vein from the mass and, and you know it's just a really clumsy instrument and and you know I think the ligature is absolutely vital for coming through the larger vessels it's great for coming to through larger um, areas of fat but it's not that fine of an instrument if you, and if you start doing small dogs and cats you're going to find that it's a very very clumsy instrument so absolutely essential but uh, years later in a case like this I would be probably getting my J hook out because my J hook or my L hook doesn't matter the configuration of it, um, even though there are disadvantages to monopolar versus a bipolar vessel sealer, uh, for me, it's a much finer instrument and I can get into those, those delicate little planes, uh, vascular planes more easily. So I'll show you a couple of examples of that. Don't forget the lateral thermal spread with the vessel sealers, okay? It's probably, uh, there's less energy, dis um, lateral energy dispersion as monopole compared to monopolar, but there's still one to two millimeters of lateral thermal spread. Having said that, you can use them fairly close. Look, here's one, you can see cable wall there. What have I got there? A millimeter or two of distance between my vessel sealer and my caver. And in general, I'm gonna be pretty comfortable with that. OK, uh, but obviously we do not want those instruments lying on the wall of a caver because uh, they're going to melt a hole and touch wood. That hasn't happened to me yet, but it'll happen one day, probably. All right. So I'm going to make a pitch for the J hook. This is kind of a running joke in our institution. Um, I am accused of being obsessed with the J hook, uh, but I like it because you can just poke that thing into any plane. And of course, you can turn it around. You can rotate it. You can push planes, you can pull planes, you can do whatever you want. So think of it, you know, it's kind of like the poor man's robotic arm because you can, uh, uh, you can move it in a multitude of directions as opposed to the vessel sealer, which can only ever be used in the trajectory that it comes in at, right? So for me, that's a very helpful thing. Now, again, there's lateral thermal spread with these, there's peripheral energy dispersion. So you wanna be away from those uh, you don't want to be coming through, you know, large vessels. Obviously, it's, uh, monopolar is not going to be suitable for just coming through a substantial phrenico-abdominal vein, for instance. But I find it great for these little fine planes. And I, and I will often pick away at those planes to try and find my plane between uh, my cava um, and uh, my adrenal mass, especially on the right-hand side. 
So here we can see we're sort of using a combination of hemostatic devices. I've done most of the work with the J-hook, but of course I know now that my phrenico-abdominal vein is coming because you see the two poles of the adrenal tumor. So my phrenico-abdominal is gonna be lying in between there, right? Always look for that or look for it on the CT so you can, um, so you can predict where you're gonna meet that phrenico-abdominal vein. Sometimes it's an obvious structure, but sometimes it's not and it's hidden inside those tissue planes, all right? All right, don't forget about the uh, phrenico-abdominal vein and artery on the lateral side of the mass. That can give you a big old bleed if you forget about it. So here's a little cranial pole right-sided mass. Look how big that, that um, phrenico-abdominal neurovascular bundle is. It's actually at that point where it dives under the cranial pole of the kidney, that's actually the cranial abdominal branch. And we don't wanna miss that because uh, it's a really substantial vessel and we can get a substantial bleed from that if we miss it, okay? Um, here's another example. Uh, of, of um, finding that uh, phrenico-abdominal uh, artery and vein on, the, sorry, cranial abdominal artery and vein on the lateral side. So here we're starting our, um, our right-sided dissection. Notice that liver lobe's a bit pesky. Honestly, I find the, the interference of other organs on the right side much more easy to deal with than on the left side. It's at worst, it's usually a little bit of liver. Sometimes we'll get a little, you know, the, the, the kidney on the left will flop a lot onto adrenal masses. That doesn't happen so much on the right. This is a tricky one, right? This is one of those very caudal pole right-sided lesions. We have to be real careful not to burst that renal vein as we go. And there it is. There's that phrenico-abdominal artery and vein, cranial abdominal artery and vein on the lateral aspect. Make sure you get a vessel sealer on that. The J-hook's not going to do the job for that one in any kind of sizable dog, okay? So we've got to be using all of those vessel sealing modalities uh, at our disposal. And of course, as we drop the energy onto that, beware that you're not in contact with the renal vein just a little further up the shaft of the vessel sealer because you might frazzle that as you go, okay? All right, so uh, complications, don't panic. You know, it's easy to say that. Um, and at the beginning of our learning curve, we do tend to panic, but um, stuff happens in the OR. And, and it's interesting to look at human, you know, uh, videos of human um, laparoscopic surgeries because they, you know, they hate to convert because conversion is associated with, with all sorts of greater complications, wound healing issues. You know, we're very lucky in cats and dogs. We don't have nearly as many wound healing issues as they do in people. And so they, they sort of get on with it and deal with these conversions. And I think as your learning curve, as your experience grows, you might be able to do the same thing and, and sort of uh, handle some of these complications without conversion. And of course, don't forget, conversion is good surgical judgment. It is if, if you've got a morbidity that's occurring that is potentially life-threatening or uh, uh, you know, risk significant post-operative morbidity, you should absolutely 100% convert. Uh, or if you're just not comfortable with the situation. But there are situations where you can uh, deal with that. And generally speaking, the ones that I've converted, I get in there and I've got four pairs of hands retracting the pancreas. And I sort of, not that I regret converting, but it's always a mess when I go in there. I much prefer to do these cases laparoscopically if they're non-invasive. So here's a nice one. We got all the toys in the world, but the toys don't always work. So here's a phrenico-abdominal vein that we skeletonized, I think pretty nicely. We drop the energy on it. It seals for about 1.3 seconds and then it pops open. Okay, so that's a phrenic abdominal vein on the tumor side, right? So that's on the tumor side. So I'm not gonna panic too much because it looked to me like my cava was okay. Um, it wasn't bleeding from my cable side. So I try to re-grasp it and re-seal um, re, um, it. But at that point it is sort of retracted up against the tumor. But the big difference here is that, you know, I was, I was well on my way during this procedure. Um, and I found that when I put suction on it and I tamponaded it, it slowed down. It never really completely stopped until I got around the other side and took care of uh, the, the cranial abdominal vessels on the other side. Um, but um, long and short of it was I had taken down enough vascularity from that mass that with a little bit of ongoing tamponade from an instrument on there and uh, plugging away, I was able to get that job done without conversion. Okay, now that may be the right decision or the wrong decision in different people's hands, um, but let's just say I got away, uh, got away with that one, okay? Um, hang on a second. Okay, so uh, diaphragmatic perforation was always, uh, was always something I read about, never ha happened to me before until this day. Uh, this is mainly gonna happen with cranial pole right-sided lesions. So here it is, I did my dissection and I didn't stay close enough to my capsule. Uh, so I got a nice little hole in the diaphragm, okay? So you can see it there, we've got some 
uh, we got some frayed, oh, now I can see my mouse for some reason. I got some frayed um, uh, diaphragmatic muscle fibers there, little hole, about a centimeter or so. So I talked to anesthesia. They didn't notice really any differences despite this pneumothorax that had developed. You can see the billowing of the diaphragm above me. This dog was surprisingly tolerant of this pneumo. Um, and so what I decided to do is just put a, a red rubber in through a small uh, extra port. Um, uh, I started sucking the pneumothorax out and then I got my needle holders and I just dropped a cruciate suture um, in and around there. Um, uh, and I was able to close that up. I don't have the video of the whole thing, but you guys get the general idea that um, I was able to come around that with a cruciate suture, sucked everything out, just kind of like you would with a normal diaphragmatic hernia open, and then closed that up. And so again, not, um, not quite the crisis it was, but it could have been because there are dogs uh, that as soon as you have a pneumothorax form and you've got positive pressure ventilation going in there, they will, they will crash on you pretty quick. So that's very much a judgment call based on um, uh, what's going on with the anesthesia, if you ask me. Okay, so uh, stay close to the tumor capsule for that. All right, what about this one? This is a, probably the most common significant bleed that I've seen, okay? So this is the cranial abdominal vessel that was not shown enough respect, okay? So I went around the back of it, you can see it, it's diving off under that, that uh, cranial pole of the kidney, it's a left-sided tumor, but I can see it pretty well. I've got suction ready. Uh, and remember, that's an area where there isn't too much uh, danger, okay? There aren't too many huge vessels in there. The ureter is much more caudal to that. And so I take a little bit of time. I try and clean the area up a little bit with suction. I see where it's coming from. I grasp not too deeply, okay? And uh, I managed to stop the bleeding. So was that a case I should have converted? Well. Sort of what went through my brain was, uh, this is bleeding from a cranial abdominal branch. I know it's not a huge vessel. I can see it pretty well. Uh, I know where it's coming from and it's pretty close to the end of the procedure. So um, I'm gonna persist with that. I'm not gonna convert that. I'm gonna work away for a few minutes. And if it doesn't work out and it keeps bleeding, obviously conversion is the right thing to do, but you don't necessarily need to jump to conversion right away on those kind of cases. Here's another one, okay? So this is a renal vein bleed. So it's a left laparoscopic adrenalectomy. This, this, um, this has only happened to me uh, once really. Um, and um, what we see here is we've, we haven't got great visualization. I'm fairly close to the beginning of my procedure. And I go ahead and I put my suction in there probably a little bit too roughly. Uh, this is the kidney here falling down on us. Classic case for a fourth needle scopic port or any kind of port. It doesn't matter if you don't have the needle scopic equipment, put a fifth, put a five millimeter fourth port in, it's no big deal. Uh, and what I see here is I see quite a lot of bright red blood and it's fairly persistent. No matter what position I push that in uh, with retraction, you know, every time I let go, it, it keeps coming at me. And of course this went on for a couple of minutes. Um, and I know that I'm in the, the very vicinity of the renal vein. You saw the renal vein at the beginning of that video. And so this is one that I converted on because I was worried that this was a renal vein tear. And in fact it was, and when I opened it up, um, there was a little tear in the renal vein. I tried to repair that renal tear uh, and I wasn't successful. The, re the kidney went a very, um, a very, very dark shade. And so we did an nephrectomy on that case. Um, and I I think that's I think that's the only time it's happened to me um, or maybe I've had two of those uh, in the cases we've done we've done about a hundred cases now uh, at, at UC Davis just under a hundred cases definitely not all my cases that's a combined caseload of, of myself and my colleagues in soft tissue doctors doctors Bolsa, Steffi, Jafrida and Culp um, and uh, you know that's a serious complication and very very frustrating um, and those were sort of the things that went through my mind as to why you know I should get in there sooner than later so I would call that a truly the dog wasn't bleeding out I had a look for a minute or two but I, a, a case where uh, you know uh, I think there was a clear indication in my mind for conversion at that point. What about capsular rupture? You know, you guys who have done these procedures probably know that that's um, not, you know, that does happen occasionally. This is a weird case with an interrupted, uh, it doesn't have a kidney on this side. Uh, and we got some of that toothpastey stuff from the middle. Now, I personally, uh, we've done enough of these cases now where I think that that's not necessarily an indication con for conversion. There's no doubt in my mind that this is breaking oncological principles and we are probably uh, leaving tumor cells behind here, but we seem to get away with it in these dogs. Um, you know, in the cases that we've done, yes, we have seen recurrent nodules in a small handful of cases, but it's rare. Um, it is certainly possible that recurrence is more likely than uh, more common than we think, because of course, not every adrenal dog gets
gets uh, ultrasounded routinely. Uh, and of course, it's an older population of dogs. And so they may pass away from other unrelated morbidities. But um, that is something that um, I usually carry on with. And I don't usually uh, convert uh, if I have a small area of capsular rupture. All right, and then a couple of cases to finish my uh, portion here, probably running over, um, just to show you sort of the, my thought process on a couple of borderline cases. So this is dog, uh, 20 kilogram cattle dog. Um, and this was kind of a, my example of, you know, a very large non-invasive. So, so this was a, a right-sided tumor, really pretty big. If I run the CT, uh, you'll see it coming up here, okay? Big, big tumor. Uh, is big, if not bigger than the kidney on that side. A lot of compression of the cava, but not uh, any obvious invasion. And also very multi-lobular, okay? A mixed, um, uh, mixed signal on the CT. Actually away from the renal vein. So we've got that going for us, but just a really, really big tumor. And when we get in surgery with this dog, it's, you know, it's so big, this tumor. This, I think this was sort of close to six centimeters or so that it's just so incredibly vascular. And this was sort of in the category of, well, you know, how hard do you want to make your life? You know, is this something that you want to do uh, laparoscopically? And this is probably one of the only exclusions in my book for a lap uh, case. If I've got a really huge tumor, um, uh, you know, uh, unless of course it's invasive, in which case we do, we do all of those. If there's vascular invasion, of course, we do those cases um, open. But uh, the only ones that I won't do laparoscopically are these really big ones or ones that are very multi-lobulated. And we got this one done, but it was, it was a challenge. It took longer than usual. You know, there's probably more blood loss uh, than, than your average case. And so that's a sort of real borderline kind of situation for me. And, and risk factors for conversion in, in human surgery, uh, you know, are um, tumor size over five centimeters, um, high uh, body mass index, and also some papers will say pheochromocytomas. We haven't found a particular predisposition. I haven't run the stats on that, but we have about a, we've had about a, a nine to 10% uh, conversion rate in our cases. Um, and we have exactly the same conversion rate. Um, I looked this morning, we had, uh, we've done 21 pheos and we have converted two of them. So about a 10% conversion rate on the pheos too. So I don't think there's a, a big difference there, uh, but we'll, we're gonna get some big numbers together fairly soon from a couple of different institutions. And so we might have a better idea Idea for, for what those specific conversion factors are. Um, all right, so here's another one. This one was a caudal pole tumor in a small dog, six and a half kilogram dog. And, and these caudal pole tumors are much harder than the cranial pole tumors because, you know, they often hug that renal vein. You can see that renal vein is, is really stretched around the back there. Uh, and this one, I didn't get very far before I converted because what I found, and the video is not very good because I, I didn't run the video for, for the length of the procedure before I converted. But what I found was that this area of renal vein up here was so intimately attached um, that uh, we really didn't get um, very far before we got significant amounts of bleeding. And when we blow that, um, that area up on the CT, what we find is this sort of irregular moth-eaten kind of appearance of the renal vein. And I think, that's, um, I think that's parasitization of blood supply from the renal vasculature into the tumor. And if I see that now, I really worry about that because you know we, we, um, everything we touched uh, was, uh, was bleeding quite profusely. It was a small dog. And even when we opened it up, we weren't able to save that renal vein and we ended up doing an nephrectomy on that dog. So that's another sort of one of those kind of uh, warning signs to me. Uh, if we see that, I'm, I'm worried about that case and I might consider next time doing that case um, as an open procedure. Um, and then this last case I'll just show you was a bigger dog. So uh, a little bit more uh, luxury in terms of room to work and so forth. It's a bilateral tumor. The, the right-sided one was not particularly interesting. It was small and came out fairly easily. The left-sided one was interesting to me. And what piqued my interest in this was looking at this CT, you know, we often don't, we, we don't often need to deal with the renal artery. The renal artery tends to dive down towards the aorta um, underneath the renal vein or dorsal to the renal vein. Um, and we often don't see it. But in this case, that renal artery was, was quite obviously on the uh, lateral aspect of the tumor. And I assume this was just associated with where the tumor had originated in the gland. Um, and when we did a, a CT, um, uh, rendering of that, uh, you know, you could see that renal artery running behind. I don't know why my mouse is 
there on some and not there on others. Maybe I'll just escape out of here for one second so you can see it. But what, what you can see is uh, that renal artery running on the lateral aspect right there. And so again, look at, really study those CTs. If you're lucky enough to have radiologists in your building, you know, really study those CTs with them, get used to looking at them yourself, because again, we want to anticipate those things so that, you know, if they're buried in a bunch of fat, we know when to expect them, when to see them. And it was a little bit unusual that it was running on the lateral aspect in a sort of fairly cranial or orientation, which I wasn't used to. You can also get a really nice view of that phrenico-abdominal vein and that cranial abdominal branch here running underneath the cranial pole of the kidney on this left-sided tumor, okay? Um, good, and so when we go to the, the video from that surgery, you know, um, sure enough, here's our renal artery and we can see it diving off on the lateral aspect. And it's really nice to know ahead of time that that's where you're gonna find that guy. And so you can really take care uh, and anticipate um, those things. Okay, um, so those are sort of some tips and tricks that I found uh, over the years. Hopefully that's helpful for you guys. I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, I'll come out of here and unshare my screen. Um, uh, Kelly, I don't know if we're doing questions now or just at the very end, um, but I thank you for your uh, attention. And um, you know, I'm happy, to, I'm happy to take any questions now or later as the case may be. Okay, Jill, that was great. Uh, some really good tips in there. We do have a couple of questions. First, in the case of medium bleeding, um, do you advise that you could lower the patient's pneumoperitoneum and then use a fibrin hemostat to have time to decide if you're going to convert? Yeah, I, you know, I've never used a fibrin hemostatic agent, so I would love to hear experiences on that. Um, uh, because we haven't had that available to us. I don't know if there's any newer, it, 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 the last time I looked into that, it was kind of prohibitively expensive. Uh, and I don't know if that's changed, that was a while ago. So I would love to, to know if um, other people have a cost, a reasonable cost uh, um, fiber and hemostat that can be applied laparoscopically, that'd be great. Uh, I haven't tended to lower the patient's pneumoperitoneum, I must say. Um, um, I have not really done that on a regular basis. Great. The next question is, I know this sounds crazy, but I see that bleeding is a big complication. Do you think that it could be possible to put a small balloon through the jugular vein to occlude the caudal vena cava caudal to the tumor? Do you think it would be feasible? Yeah, interesting. Um, and I don't, I, I don't, I don't know the answer to that. I don't know if the IR crowd would um, would have a better sense for that. My my sense is that there is so much neovascularization with these tumors when they get bigger that um, you know we tend to we te we we tend to just see them sucking blood supply from everything around there so i don't know if that would lead to a significant reduction in bleeding uh, it's a great it's a great point it'd be a very interesting project to do you know my theory on my my sort of um, ethos on adrenal tumors, uh, be it open or laparoscopic, is that it's a race against time to rob that tumor of as much vascularity as possible. So that if I do get a big capsular bleed, or I do get a phrenico-abdominal bleed, it's less dramatic than it could be. So if that means in some cases going around the back and taking out the blood supply around the back, because that's an easy plane to get to, um, you know, I'll sometimes do that. Uh, I just, I try and do the easy planes um, uh, uh, as soon as I can, because I figure that those are going to rob some blood supply. Uh, and one of the other things that I tend to do quite often, which probably alarms my surgical assistants, is, is if, if, I, if I have a non, what I would term a nuisance bleeder um, from the capsule or elsewhere, what I'll sometimes do is I'll just forget about that area and I'll just go and work somewhere else. Now, obviously, <laughs> I'm not going to do that with that renal vein bleed I showed you. But if I have those nuisance bleeders that are sort of uh, robbing me of visualization and uh, constantly um, making it difficult to see the tissues that I need to see. I'll sometimes just let the let the tumor fall away. Uh, I'll go away from that area. I'll work somewhere else for five minutes, and then I'll come back. By which time, those small capsular bleeders often will have clotted up, and you can sort of get on with your job, so to speak. Great. Uh, we've got one more question, and then we'll move on. And, and if we have time to get to the others, we will. Um, the last question is. Do you have experience using hemostatic clips to control hemorrhage as an alternative to the bipolar vessel sealing device? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I, what I, what I have, uh, I have sometimes found, and I, I have some videos on it, but I didn't, I didn't want to go over time too much. But I've definitely used hemostatic clips 
on the phrenic abdominal vein. And what you'll sometimes find is that you'll, you'll, you'll have a few cases where the phrenic abdominal that is accessible to you between the adrenal mass and the cava is so incredibly short that you don't feel like you can get a vessel sealer in there across it. And in those cases, I'll drop one or two or three clips on there. I've even had cases where I've done in, a little intracorporeal suture um, uh, on that phrenic abdominal vein because there are cases where there's so little space in there. But if I feel like I can get my vessel sealer in and I can get a millimeter or two off of the cable wall and I feel good about that, then I'll usually just rely on the vessel sealer but I think it would be very, very reasonable to use clips uh, fairly routinely uh, on there as well. Awesome, Phil. That was great. Thank you. All right. Thanks a lot. Um, our next presenter is Dr. Felipe Leo. Dr. Leo is the Director of Veterinary Medicine at Vina Del Mar campus of Andres Bello University and Chair of Veterinary Surgical Services there. Today, he's talking about retroperitoneal approach for laparoscopic adrenalectomy. Uh, thank you, Kelly. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, okay, um, you're hearing? Okay, that's okay. Yeah, it's working. Okay. Okay, well, well. Uh, hello everyone, uh, my name is Felipe Lillo and I have the pleasure to participate in this webinar. Thank you, you all for listening tonight. Our topic, topic in hand is to discuss and explore the retroperitoneal approach for adrenal tumors. Laparoscopic adrenal ectomy is considered uh, an advanced lab surgery, as you know. Probably one of the keys of success resides in the possibility of choosing the right approach and technique. You already know that minimal invasive, uh, invasive alternatives, uh, the most used are lateral and sternal transperitoneal approaches. But there is a retroperitoneal technique described in humans. Uh, is this a uh, valid op option for us? In our practice, we are using it, use it uh, on a regular basis, but uh, where this is come from? Well, let's start with one case for us, a similar case where, uh, as the, the field show us. Uh, we need, we knew, uh, ah, there it is. We knew that right adrenalectomies are challenging and time consuming. The possibility of the tumor has a retrocaudal portion, uh, the caudal lobe decides to, to not collaborate with the visualization and the very tight junction between uh, the capsule of adrenal gland with the vena cava increases the chance of having some problem. In this, ca in this case, in this case, right here, in this case, um, during the elevation of the liver, uh, my grasper punctured the diaphragm causing a pneumothorax, pneumothorax as you can see. Uh, back then, we decided to repair, repair the uh, diaphragmatic defect and move on. But with that experience, we learned that we must to improve or make changes in that surgery. And for that, we used some clients. So why just write adrenal tumors? This is a summary of our surgical outcomes of uh, transperitoneal left adrenalectomies. Major compli complication doesn't exceed uh, the 4%. By, by chemical and clinical goals are reached, reached in a high rate and a lim in a limited period of time. And that's why I think we don't have any question here. Probably our case selection cr criteria and action procedures are working just fine. Uh, and, and until now, at least. But so what's up with the right tumors? Uh, I don't know what you thought about uh, right adrenal tumors, but my expression is always, always like this. Uh, and it's, it gets worse when the tumor is about, uh, it's about uh, five or six uh, centimeters and three different uh, image guys couldn't decide if there is, there is an invasion or not in the CD. Well, knowing the source of problems, 
we have two alternative, alternatives. Improve the visualization through more separation or change the approach. Then, what, the, what evidence do, you, do we have for this retroperitoneal thing that is used in children? The general idea is to insufflate the retroperitoneal virtual space to generate a working space uh, using the peritoneum as natural separator, leaving the retroperitoneal structures isolated from the rest of the abdominal organs. One Korean group described the feasibility of the access and different magnitude of insufflation in a cadaveric model. This experience demonstrates that the approach, uh, the approach is related to a good visualization of the adrenal plan. Also in cadavers, we explore uh, different port portal settings for retroperitonoscopic adrenalectomy. Long story short, a multi-port setting is not a very good idea if you uh, want to take out adrenal tumors with this approach. Um, in addition, we found that uh, single port systems are better alternative and that their installation is easier under direct laparoscopic vision. As you can see in the clip, there is the, where is my mouse? There is the single port, the seal port, and then, then we insufflate the retrovirginia space. The same Korean group published later the first in vivo retroperitoneoscopic adrenalectomy. This experimental study in healthy dogs encouraged us to start clinical cases because they report a reasonable surgical time, a no re relevant impact on pain scores, and very good visualization. With just a one warning, some risk of capsule rupture. In humans, the evidence supporting the retroperitoneal approach is relatively recent. We have two major meta-analyses confronting transperitoneal versus retroperitoneal. The first one of the 2018 concludes no difference in operative variables as bleeding, surgical time, or intrasurgical complications. But some post op variables were in favor of retroperitoneal technique over the transperitoneal. The second meta analysis of 2020 concludes that the retroperitoneal approach was associated with shorter surgical time times less blood loss and hospital stay. Another isolated clinical study in humans found a fewer, fewer um, adverse effects and short learning curves in the retroperitoneal technique, so it's easy to learn. I believe that new studies will come out with uh, this time of comparison and the trend of the results will be similar, I think, or, or I hope. Well, we put all our ideas uh, together in order to start, uh, to start a prospective clinical study with well-defined selection criteria and a lot of variables, a very lot of variables. And now I think there are, there, there are too many of them. Um, I had some regret, regret that there. Um, and then we start the fun part of this. Uh, we start to operate patients. After some pilot surgery, to surgeries, we decide the best position of this for this is uh, was a, a slightly tilt lateral recumbency. We always use a, a five millimeter a transperitoneal portal to guide the creation of the pneumo retroperitoneum. If you need to come, uh, if if you need to convert to transperitoneal uh, laparoscopy for a uh, complication during the surgery, that portal could be used as the right instrument port. We use a seal port, uh, as you know. Our recommendation is to put, put it immediately lateral, lateral to epoxal muscles and 10 to 12 centimeter color to the last rib to allow caudal to cranial trajectory of the instrument. The idea is the seal sport. It's uh, place it um, around the caudal pole of the kidney. 
this is a short video and you can see through a uh, lab vision how how we make the, the pneumo retroperitoneum. First, we create the space with uh, a finger dissection, and then install the we install the seal sport and insufflate. Usually, five millimeters is enough to have a good space, um, and obviously, you need to remember to eliminate the pneumo peritoneum before starting the surgery. I said this because I forgot that a couple of times and I struggled a little bit with that uh, until I realized uh, I need to uh, I realize, realize that. Uh, here there's, uh, there are some images of the surgical field on the left side. Um, you can see one tumor um, with a phrenic abdominal vein passing by. We usually start with the vascular control sealing that, in that vein, um, as the, this other image uh, is shown. In the video, you can see how we dissect the gland from caudal to cranial, grasping, grasping the gland from the severed vein or uh, the caudal adrenal pedic pedicle, uh, also severed or, or sealed. That's the the idea of the technique is a very small uh, working space, but um, it's not that difficult. This is a more extensive video. Well, this is the retroperitoneal space. First, you need to mobilize the renal fat pad to lateral. The adrenal gland will be always between the kidney and the fat. It's very important to uh, not break the peritoneum because obviously the CO2 will lead to abdomen uh, to the abdomen, and the working space will reduce drastically. This is the <clears throat> cranial pole of the kidney. There is our small tumor. In this case, is very small tumor. I prefer to use harmonic device because it's a small lateral thermal spread, uh, but really it's a personal choice. If you use it, you need to make sure that the active blade, black one, is always, fa always facing up to avoid major uh, vascular trauma. You can see some dissection. <clears throat> the vena cava is not right below the gland. It's a couple centimeter, a centimeters uh, medially. It's like there. <clears throat> so you, you don't have uh, to worry so much for that. Renal artery and vein are easily, easily distinguishable uh, on the medial, medial and caudal sector. It's like, uh, like there, I think. It's very, very far away of the working uh, worker in space of the surgical field. We are taking out this little tumor. We always check for, for bleedings with three or less uh, millimeter of mercury and asper aspirate all residual gas before closing. That is very important because a residual uh, gas in the retroperitoneal space will be um, the source of pain of discomfort for, uh, to the uh, for the patient. Initially, we have similar outcomes than that the left uh, laparoscopic transperitoneal adrenal ectopies, but better results than the, than the right ones. These are some ample published data of our experience. As we felt, uh, surgical time was similar to left laparoscopic adrenal ectomies, but significantly shorter than the right ones. 
the opioid, opioid rescue requirement behave similar, similar to surgical time. Left lap and retro were the same and less than the right lap. Um, until now, we don't that uh, we don't detect any difference in the blood loss and complication, com uh, and complication just in a little bit in the uh, in the minor complications setting. We use this this system. The Clavian system is very hand, uh, handy for uh, classificate your your complications. What is the limi limitation of this? Uh, well, this result became from a, an intent of a clinical trial. So the cohorts are not symmetrical. That's why we need more cases to, to draw generic recommendations. We don't assess maneuvering difficulties as measuring the number of movement per surgery or something like that. Um, and some things are still not well standardized, standardized uh, as the ceiling device we use. As final me uh, message, uh, I can say the retroperitoneoscopic carbonylectomy is a valid alternative in dog, but we need to know more about it. Probably this is, will be uh, a surgeon choice and uh, not a general recommendation. Um, we invite to you to try this approach or that is support that is easy to learn and uh, could be your next favorite, favorite surgery. I think uh, that could be a uh, um, uh, possibility in your future. Um, thank you. Thank you very much for listening. I want to dedicate this seminar to Jai Ramirez, a terrible loss we had just last week uh, in our hospital. Thank you very much. We happily try to uh, answer some questions. We say that was great. Um, we have a question for you that is, have you used endocyanin as an adjunct or aid in the approach of retroperitoneal adrenalectomy? So, sorry, uh, could you repeat, please? Have you used ICG? Ah. As an okay. adjunct or aid in the approach? No, no, I, I'm, no, I had, um, I, I don't have uh, the possibility of use it. Uh, I don't have the possibility of get it, uh, but could be um, a good aid for this approach. Thank you, Felipe, for the, the question. And then next question is, have you performed the retroperitoneal approach for the left adrenalectomy? No, 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 really don't have any, uh, uh, any experience on that because we don't have any problems with la left adrenalectomies. Uh, we have a, a very good uh, outcomes and I think it's not worth it. And then last question for now, um, do you think that you would recommend the same guidelines like as far as tumor size or do you think that you would need to stay towards smaller tumors using this approach? For now, I think uh, oh, oh, we, we prefer this approach with the smaller tumors, but it's probably because we need some uh, more experience in that. Um, but for now, the recommendation is for tumors of uh, no more than three centimeters, three or four max tops. Great. Thank you, Felipe. That was really interesting. Thank you, Kelly. And last, we have um, Dr. Amit Singh. He is a surgeon at the Ontario Veterinary College at the University of Guelph, and he will be talking about laparoscopic adrenalectomy in cats tonight. All right, thanks so much, uh, Kelly. Really appreciate uh, <coughs> you 
keeping us in line here and thanks to Chris as well for as usual for uh, you know setting up the webinar and the organization behind that it's uh, really well appreciated and thanks to everyone who's tuned in I know it's uh, might be an early morning or a late night for some of you so thanks for joining us um, yeah, I, I think I'd be remiss if I didn't, um, you know, put in a, a, a short shameless plug uh, for the upcoming webinars for uh, the spring. Uh, we have a really great lineup and, uh, you know, hope that you can all join us for these. And, you know, as Chris mentioned, definitely let us know if you have any feedback for this and other webinars or other topics that you may want to know. We're certainly in the planning stages for uh, the summer and then uh, into the fall. So, you know, we'd love to hear from you. And then, you know, um, Chris mentioned it as well. We're really excited, uh, you know, really looking forward to our next in-person meeting, um, you know, hoping it's going to, uh, you know, be the world, uh, the world and DOSC meeting that Dr. Monet has uh, been organizing. We've got uh, info on our website and uh, you know if there's any questions just uh, about this just uh, you know check out that website. All right so you know I, I, um, I certainly don't confess to be a, a feline adrenal uh, disease expert uh, or you know particularly um, you know treating uh, you know these tumors laparoscopically I'm certainly um, you know happy to share and, and wanted to uh, you know get some of your wisdom on the treatment uh, the collective group's wisdom kind of on the laparoscopic treatment of uh, adrenal disease in cats uh, I've, I've certainly um, you know, learned a lot in treating these cases. It's a really interesting uh, physiology. You know, the most commonly we see uh, these adrenal tumors in cats being aldosterone secreting, uh, resulting in hyperaldosteronism. You know, the classic, uh, let me just pull up my, my pointer. Uh, you know, the classic uh, uh, signs of um, hyperaldosteronism we're, we're seeing in this cat and that's, uh, you know, hypokalemia and a, a myopathy from hypokalemia. We also see arterial hypertension. You know, we've um, seen cats that have showed up that are acutely blind from this. And this is uh, these signs in combination. Uh, you know, as many of you experienced group obviously know this is called Kahn syndrome. And I think uh, the pre-treatment or perioperative treatment certainly revolves around that in dealing with the potassium. So it's potassium supplementation, um, postoperatively monitoring for hyperkalemia once we remove those tumors. Uh, there's a, if, if you are interested and probably you've come across this, there's a great review uh, by Dr. Kuistra uh, in Vet Clinics of North America that reviews uh, hyperaldosteronism in cats. It, it's seemingly, you know, it's um, claimed it's a seemingly underdiagnosed disorder because a lot of times, you know, hyper, hypokalemia and or hypertension, it's kind of uh, assumed it may be renal in origin. So some really neat stuff. Uh, you know, I'm definitely not the one to continue talking about the physiology on that. And, uh, you know, I wanted to, um, you know, share uh, some, you know, tips and tricks on, on do, doing feline uh, lap adrenals. I think, uh, you know, I've learned a lot from the, the VES group and, um, you know, and I probably will echo some of Phil's tips because, you know, I got them from him. And, uh, you know, the first one I think is poor placement. It's very, very similar than in a dog. Uh, you know, I definitely prefer to have these cats kind of in semi-lateral, but to have access to ventral midline, um, you know, certainly, you know, maybe pericostal is, uh, you know, as a rescue is a little bit easier in cats. It may be, but, uh, you know, maybe I'm, I'm just uh, old fashioned, but I just prefer if the conversion is, and, and you know, you will expect a higher conversion rate in cats, most definitely, uh, you know, I prefer to go in through ventral midline. And then, um, you know, looking at port placement, you know, if we look at that telescope port, it was just as, as Phil mentioned, you know, a few centimeters lateral from the umbilicus so that you can get that angulation onto the adrenal. You know, that's a tip from Phil, from Gilles, uh, and, and I think it's a good one. And then the other ports, uh, you know, I'm a big fan of the, the fourth port for a retractor. You know, in this image, you know, there's a five millimeter, six millimeter port in there, but certainly the mini lap uh, with a three millimeter port, 
Uh, that's something I use frequently as well, that the needle scopic, we recently got the, the two millimeter instruments in. I think that's a great addition. And, you know, I will never forget that advice. We had a great um, human pediatric surgeon uh, do our keynote uh, at the VS in 2017. And he called them freebie ports, as Phil mentioned, and he uses them all the time in kids. And I think that's some great advice where, you know, the two and three millimeter ports, certainly they can just it's just a skin incision to close them. That being said, you know, no hesitation placing placing a five or six millimeter port in. And you know, these ports they're all placed kind of in a triangulating fashion, obviously, just to optimize your uh, angle of instrumentation into uh, or getting your instrumentation to the adrenal. So one thing, this is obviously an issue in cats and, and probably, again, you know, very experienced group uh, here that um, probably have experienced this as well, but I'll just play the video, but this is something that I've experienced in cats. They have a very thin body wall and, um, you know, this is uh, the, the six millimeter threaded trocar. It is a heavy trocar, but, um, you know, it's something that, uh, you know, expect that to happen in a thin walled cat and it's, it can be very, uh, it can be a big nuisance as you're bringing a telescope or an instrument in and out of that port. One thing you can do is, is just place a purse string around the body wall and it will minimize this uh, occurrence. So something to think about, I've had this happen where I've had to convert a couple of these cases because, uh, you know, just loss of insufflation. And so, um, you know, something to think about, perhaps I should have been using, you know, maybe some of the plastic reusable ports, maybe those would have been a better choice than some of these heavier, uh, heavier ports. The next thing, I mean, I think it's fairly obvious, but, um, you know, I, I, if we are going down the route of, uh, you know, adrenalectomy, I think, uh, you know, using contrast enhanced CT is absolutely essential to guide case selection. You know, if this is one of the first cases that you're initiating, you know, certainly using CT to uh, choose, is this, is this a good one for laparoscopy? Is this going to be one that, uh, you know, we should do open? It can be extremely helpful and um, you know as as I've put in uh, the slide here this is kind of like your dream lesion uh, you know we've got lots of room on the phrenico abdominal vein here lots of distance from the renal vein on this left-sided lesion and this is uh, you know this is I wish every case was like this and certainly it's a it's a great one to do laparoscopic and certainly you know you can you know exactly what you're going to get into if you have these CT images and if we just click on the next slide this is a, a right-sided tumor in a cat certainly you know this dissection the approach you know, the proximity to the renal vein, the cardinal vena cava, you know, this is going to be a little bit more of a challenging dissection. And so the, the, the CT can really help with your case selection uh, and, and really make you aware of what you're going to face intraoperatively. Okay, a couple other, uh, you know, tips and tricks regarding instrumentation. You know, we briefly mentioned it, but, you know, the three millimeter instrumentation, and then Phil mentioned the two millimeter even, uh, you know, the, these sets of instruments, absolutely essential and very, very you know, I think critical when you're using or uh, when you're doing adrenalectomy in cats, these small instruments, they just allow you to get into tighter planes that certainly, uh, you know, it's not that you will be doing the procedure exclusively with uh, these sizes of instrumentation, although, you know, certainly that's probably on the horizon, needlescopic adrenalectomy, but certainly some tight planes around the cava, around the renal vein, around the phrenico abdominal, uh, you know, certainly these these smaller instruments really helpful and um, you know I just want to point out a couple of other things is that you know if you you've placed six millimeter trocars you can have or you can get what uh, are called these reducer caps so here's a five millimeter to three millimeter reducer cap and so it's a really handy device it's from Stortz you can uh, flip this over the valve cap on your six millimeter port place a three millimeter instrument into that, you won't have any leakage. It's the point of the cap, flip it off, and then insert a five millimeter instrument as you need, as your dissection is progressing, 
you know, depending on what size instrumentation you need at that particular time. The other, you know, the, the, the poor man's way to do this is to just get a three millimeter valve cap. Uh, you know, perhaps there's a better way to do this than what I do, but, uh, you know, if I am going to use the cap, I only have one of these. And so if I need a second one, I will just take the five millimeter, the six millimeter uh, valve cap off and put a three millimeter one on, insert a three millimeter instrument through there, and there'll be no pneumoperitoneum loss. So certainly if there's a better way to do that, please let me know. Uh, but, you know, those are some options that allow you, um, you know, there, there are these, these three millimeter, um, this is actually three and a half millimeter diameter um, trocar. It, they're really nice, but, you know, you're limited to just using the three millimeter instrumentation through those ports, obviously. And so it's nice to have these reducer caps, uh, you know, where you can interchange the five and three millimeter instrumentation. Okay, so getting into the procedure, uh, you know, Phil mentioned this, uh, you know, in his, in his great talk, uh, <clears throat> these tumors, they're often buried in fat. And he showed a video where, uh, so this is a left-sided lesion. This is the um, left kidney, obviously, and retracting that, uh, you know, I think it's absolutely essential. I do that in dogs as well. I really like putting some tension on the kidney. And here, here we are inserting, this is that one of those three and a half millimeter um, graphite ports and just putting in a three millimeter grasper here just to uh, you know retract that kidney and just give better access to these tumors in cats they're often buried in the fat and um, you know certainly suctioning using that trumpet valve as was mentioned using short bursts of suction to remove some of that fat that can improve your visualization and then you know you can start your dissection in that plane that you've created or in that space that you've created between the kidney and the adrenal gland. So really nice, uh, and, and you know, sometimes these tumors, they can even be difficult to find. So, uh, you know, be aware of, of how they can just be, um, you, you know, buried underneath these large fat deposits, um, certainly in some of these obese cats. All right, so one thing I've all, always found difficult with cats is that, you know, these are such, they're, they're smaller tumors, everything's small, obviously, and how can you, uh, you know, manipulate the gland uh, to, you know, expose some of the planes, especially around the renal vein, phrenico-abdominal vein, uh, you know, it's, it's a little bit difficult. And so, you know, in certain instances, you know, as was, as Phil mentioned, you can go caudally, seal that branch of the cranial abdominal vessel and use that stump to aid in retraction. And so that's what we're doing here. Really helpful to, uh, you know, allow you to manipulate that gland atraumatically. <clears throat> so, you know, I think um, it's the same story in dogs where this J hook it, it can be, and it, it may even be, uh, you know, even more important in cats, the J-hook or these three millimeter dissectors, really tight dissection planes. It's a coronal CT image. So obviously another left-sided uh, adrenal tumor, but you know, this one you can, you can see, this is going to be some really tight dissection along the origin of the renal vein. I guess the entry of the renal vein into the cava, you're, PAV, the phrenical abdominal vein, is, is going to be in this area as well. And, uh, you know, I'll play the video, the five millimeter instrumentation, it, it just, it's just too big in this area and it might not allow you to get into these tight planes. And so, you know, we're just using this three millimeter dissecting forceps, there's some peritoneum over, overlying and really handy. That's where the J hook could come in there now as well to peel some of that away using that three millimeter instrumentation again, very carefully, uh, just trying to open up that plane around the phrenico abdominal vein. And so that's, that's where, you know, that's where these small size, small diameter instruments, absolutely essential, I feel in, uh, you know, these, these cat adrenals. <clears throat> and, and they, you know, they, they allow this dissection to occur. Whereas, you know, some of the five millimeter instrumentation, you could get it in there, but it might not be as gentle. 
so one, um, you know, one point again with cats, it, it was mentioned, Phil mentioned this, is that, you know, sometimes there can be a really, really short distance and, you know, you can expect this on, on the, um, the CT. It's the same, the same video I'll show based on this CT. There's really no length of the PAV that you can see on the CT. And certainly if you, uh, you know, once you're dissecting caudally and stretch this out, you will see some just get to the video, but this is really difficult. And so we've isolated the phrenico-abdominal vein at this point. And, uh, you know, I'm just gonna pause the video. At this point, I'm, uh, you know, I'm, a bit, I'm in a bit of a conundrum because, you know, I would love to have a three millimeter vessel sealer device. I was really lucky, um, you know, a few years ago, I had um, Dr. Giuliani Quitzan come to visit us and she did some great work on, the, on a three millimeter vessel sealer, which would be perfect in a scenario like this, where there's literally, you know, maybe five, six millimeters of phrenico-abdominal vein available to get sealed. But I don't know if it's, uh, you know, it's a, it's a sealer that's made by a company called Boulder Surgical now. I don't know if they're in the veterinary market yet. If anybody knows of it, would love to know. Uh, we were able to get it for research purposes. But, uh, you know, I think the options are here were to place clips. And I was just a bit wary about placing clips. Uh, I feel like I needed or I want to have a little bit more tissue in between the clips. Uh, maybe I was just chicken. Um, certainly, I would love to hear if anybody would use a harmonic at this level. Uh, maybe that would have been the ideal option. Uh, it, you know, Phil mentioned intracorporeal suture. Certainly, you know, I, I ended up, I thought, okay, so here is renal vein that's traveling up. And I thought, you know what, as long as my five millimeter tips are not touching the renal vein cava, I should be okay. And so we, um, you know, we did this. I don't think there would be anything wrong. And I have done this where there are, um, uh, there was not enough room or I didn't feel confident enough where these five millimeter sealer jaws would fit without potentially traumatizing the cava or the renal vein. You know, I've done 90% of the dissection and then converted where, uh, where I didn't feel comfortable applying those five millimeter sealer jaws. I just didn't want to put a hole in, in either of those um, vessels. And this is obviously on the left side, but could certainly apply on the right side as well. So I'd certainly love to hear what, uh, you know, what the group would think on that. This is an image of those three millimeter, uh, the three millimeter sealer. It just seals. It doesn't cut. But it's, it's not a big deal. Um, and then, you know, there's a close up of the jaws. It's got a Maryland tip. I think it would be a great dissector as well. Obviously, that's its purpose. Um, and certainly it's, um, you know, it's used extensively in, in pediatric surgery. So I think it would work well in, uh, you know, in our hands. But again, would love to hear what others have used in, in situations like that. And then this is, uh, you know, this is another uh, uh, point. It's one of my last points. Um, this is a video from the OG himself. This is uh, from Dr. Mayhew. And, and uh, it's a really impressive video. You know, one thing to note is that some of these tumors, they can be very, very dorsal, and you may need to dissect on either side of that cava. So it's a right-sided tumor, but dissection may need to occur, you know, from the left side as well, just to free this up, because in cats, they can be located in quite a dorsal area. Feel free to comment, Phil, as you're going through here. But, uh, you know, that that's a... Uh, that's something to know. And, and again, you would, and I think this really highlights the importance of doing CTs prior to, um, you know, you're going to get the spatial awareness a lot more so than you would with just an ultrasound and know that this is going to be something very dorsally located, something hugging a renal vein. You know, you may, you may be aware that there's not going to be a lot of phrenico -abdominal, abdominal vein available for sealing. This is all info that you can garner from the CT pre-op. And then, uh, you know, I think these are all generally fairly smallish tumors. Some cats can get quite large adrenal tumors, to be honest, but um, generally a really nice way to get these out is using the thumb of, uh, you know, a large size surgical glove maintain oncological principles. That's, uh, you know, save your client a few hundred dollars from using an endo catch. 
So just, um, you know, just wrapping things up again, would love to hear what the group's experiences are with, um, you know, feline lap adrenals. It's certainly a, a little bit more technically demanding and, um, you know, it is in the literature and certainly at least, at least for me, I, it's a much higher conversion rate compared to dogs. You know, these can be, this is another, this is a case that I did convert on. I just could never enter this plane from the cava and the uh, adrenal. Um, certainly, I think, you know, as with anything minimally invasive, you know, <laughs> conversion, case selection, uh, you know, that's, that's going to be really important. And, you know, conversion, obviously, we, we ultimately want to get this done for our cases. And we can certainly gain a lot of experience, even if we end up converting. And, and that just allows us to push the envelope, you know, on that next case. So that's what I had for um, feline lap adrenal. Very happy to, uh, you know, answer any questions or, um, you know, I don't know, Kelly, is it something that we're, we're opening up? Do we have we have time. That was awesome. I mean, yeah, I think we, we do have, we're over time, but um, so if you guys, if people need to drop off, then go ahead. But yeah, we'll spend, we can spend a few minutes um, of discussion if people want to send in their questions. And then meanwhile, um, Phil, I don't know, and Felipe, if you had anything to add to Meet's questions. No, I mean, the problem with those cats is that that damn cava is so tiny and so delicate. So and, and I do think I've had a couple that have been just super glued onto the wall of that cava. And, you know, you pick away at them. There's the, you know, the, the, the ligature is almost a useless instrument in those in those cats. You know, you have to get something finer in there. So it's either blunt or something like a J hook. And, um, you know, they're not all like that. But but that's the big challenge with the right sided ones. But I've never um, that's a, it's a challenge whether you do it open or minimally invasively, of course. Yeah. Have you ever used clips in a cat? Um, yeah, I think I, I think I have, um, uh, I had one, I, I saw my first ever cat Fio, uh, lot, was it maybe last year or the year before I forget, I looked over the video this morning. I didn't put it in there, but, uh, and that one, I actually uh, did intracorporeal suturing. I put a clip on. And the damn clip didn't seat properly and was was a little bit mobile, so I didn't trust it. And so I put a, an intracorporeal suture on either side of it on the PAV because it was one of those ones that just didn't have the distance. It didn't have the distance to play with to put the five millimeter vessel sealer in there. So um, I just got under it with a three millimeter right angle, and then I passed some suture and put a couple of couple of sutures on it and just cut it that way. And of course that's a little bit time consuming, but um, you know, I'm not prepared to take the risk of, of dropping that vessel sealer right on the cable wall. Um, so yeah, I think you can, those are all good options. Yeah, I'm, I'm so, a bit uh, nervous. I'm sorry. I be, I, no, don't worry. I, I'm a big fan for harmonic devices. And um, I think uh, this is, a good way to to do some cat, some cats. Um, I use that. Uh, I think never use clips or other things in these cases with yeah the, this tiny tiny little color. Uh, it's it's very challenging. But uh, with the harmonic devices, it's alright. I don't have any problems with that. Um, I surely is a good recommendation for for this. Yeah, I think those hemlock clips might be the ideal thing, but I, I don't have those. I'm just worried about, you know, the endo clips when if there's not enough kind of substance in the clips, I'm like really worried that, you know, they're going to do exactly what what you mentioned, Phil. Yeah, the trouble with the hemolocks is they're huge unless they make them a lot smaller now. The ones I had uh, or the ones I have are really big. Um, but they might come, they might come in smaller sizes now. I haven't looked recently. Chris, you just stocked them. Do you know? Uh, I'm actually having trouble getting clips that I want. Uh, cause I was trying to get the WEC auto endo, uh, medium, large clips and no one is selling them. Um, and so I'm honestly just looking into what other alternatives, uh, we can get. Um, and I haven't found anything that I've been bought on yet 
One general comment that I'll make about lap, lap adrenals in general and this whole sort of question of the psychology of conversion and sort of, you know, uh, what is okay and what is not okay. It's interesting to look at the surgical time for um, in the human side. You know, we, we sort of, I think in veterinary medicine, we're kind of pre-programmed that anything that takes longer than two hours in the OR is horrifying to us, right? Because we've got like four other cases to cut or we've got something else to do or whatever. Um, and it was interesting. I looked at a couple of met meta-analyses this morning, you know, thinking about this talk. And, um, you know, they uh, the one big one I found, 500 uh, lap cases, it was like a robotic paper or whatever. But the lap, the, the median surgical time for lap was 161 minutes, you know, which is, you know, almost three hours of surgical time. So, you know, I think, I think one thing that, that we are a little bit guilty of sometimes in, in veterinary medicine is, is sort of thinking, you know, that it's a race against time. And if we have a little complication that's making, that's costing us 10 minutes or 15 minutes, you know, it's, it's the end of the world and we sort of throw in the towel. And of course, you know, um, you, you have to convert in an unsafe situation, but if, if it's a conversion for, for visualization issues that you can work on or for, you know, minor bleeding that you can manage, um, I think I'm, I'm quite guilty, I think, of, of being too impatient sometimes. And um, I don't know, uh, I don't know if uh, there's a, a lot of our Japanese friends on here, but I always I always admire the videos that that, that our Japanese friends show because they they have a very um, not that they not that they take any longer in surgery, but they have a very meticulous attitude towards these procedures, and I, I always um, I always enjoy watching their work uh, because I feel like uh, I could use a little bit of that finesse and meticulousness in my OR sometimes. <laughs> so I, I don't know. I, I you know we've we've had a couple papers now. The paper that we wrote and Eric Monet's paper, who that's I think in early view now. There's two papers that show a faster surgical time for lap adrenalectomy versus um, open for the transperitoneal approach, which is great. I I, th I take those numbers with a little grain of salt because in a, a, certainly in our papers case, I think some of those papers, um, some of the open cases were done before the advent of vessel sealing devices. And so I wonder whether some of that difference was just the fact that, you know, the open cases were done old school without vessel sealing, but still, you know, I don't think it's the end of the world if it takes, um, takes you two hours to do a lap adrenalectomy in your early learning, in the early part of your learning curve. And it's definitely taking uh, our human colleagues um, that long in many, many cases, obviously lots of different challenges there, but I thought it was a worth worth making that point. Good point, thanks. Um, we do. We have a couple of questions that have come in and one is that when there's not much of the phrenico-abdominal vein to work with, what do you think about sliding your clip down to include a small portion of the cava to give you a little bit more room for transection of the vessel? I think that I think that's a perfectly reasonable suggestion. I would I would not hesitate to do that if it increases my purchase, for sure. Great. Um, next question is um, trying. There, uh, she's had a struggle to introduce more advanced procedures into practice. Some are equipment, some problems are equipment related and others are case selection and low numbers of cases. She said that they don't see the adrenal tumors until they're huge and or invasive. And so it's hard to find one that's amenable for MIS. Do you have any suggestions on how to get colleagues on board to get the cases to surgery earlier and how to build up this caseload? So are you, Amit? <laughs> yeah, it's a it's a really good question. Uh, <clears throat> you know, I, I think um, you know, speaking with your medicine colleagues, you know, I, I'm not sure if if you're if whoever's asking this um, question is in a uh, you know a, a practice where there's other services. M your internal medicine colleagues are going to be kind of your big source of these. I think speaking to them and, uh, you know, potentially starting with journal clubs, trying to, you know, show them some of the advantages or potential advantages in doing these minimally invasive. I think that's a start, but, um, you know, certainly I think it's a, it's a slow build for sure. Uh, 
you know, I don't know, doing CE in the area, trying to build awareness to other, you know, internists that you may have access to that are feeding you cases. Um, you know, I think that can be helpful as well. I don't know, more and more in, in our in our practice, um, you know, for sure, owners are becoming more and more aware of this. I think I've definitely noticed that at least in the last four or five years that more and more owners are becoming aware of minimally invasive techniques. I don't know, at the top of my head, that's kind of um, how kind of how I've kind of approached that. I don't know if anyone else um, had any comments. I mean, I think the golden question with these adrenal tumors is, you know, are we over treating them? And, and, uh, and the laparoscopic cohort would be the cohort where we would be most guilty, right? Because they are sometimes the smaller lesions. Your average signalman is a grizzled old 12 year old terrier, you know, and, and is, is that dog going to outlive his disease process or is, you know, is he going to die of an unrelated condition? um sooner rather than later and and you know you know the challenge is i mean we 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 sort of see a lot of these because i think the the nelson and feldman era at uc davis was that you know if you saw a tumor there you treated it and sometimes we're treating the owner's paranoia having they have they've been told that there's a mass in their dog and they just want it out and all the rest of it um you know if it's a little bit of an easier decision when it's functional on the human side with those incidental omas you know when you work in a big academic hospital and you have a you have this whole group of internists who are ultrasounding dogs all day long you know they find these things um and on the human side the the um the nih has a big document on the um standard operating procedure for adrenal incidental loma it's an interesting read you know they've figured out um the criteria and i forget them exactly but it's over a certain size a surprisingly large size actually i want to say it's four centimeters you know, if someone, if some doc said to me that I had a three and a half centimeter adrenal tumor, I think I'd want them to tell, to get it out of their stat. But anyway, um, it's a surprisingly big size progression. Uh, obviously it, it, it spurs an endocrine workup for functionality. And if it's functional, it comes out, you know, there's a whole raft of, of um, suggestions or, or uh, you know, really a protocol to follow for incidental omas on the human side. And we probably should work on that for our cases. We know that incidental omas are pretty common um, and we probably overtreat some of them, you know, uh, and I have cases where I sort of tell owners that I don't think they should touch their dog's adrenal mass because, you know, it's 17 and it's got six other comorbidities. So that's the, that's the big tricky question for me, but it's hard to do the study where you have an arm that doesn't receive treatment, right? Um, it's a little bit hard to do that study, but it would be a, a worthwhile project. Yeah, that's interesting. Good point. Um, another couple of questions about equipment. Have any of you tried the me seal device by Microline Surgical for vessel sealing? I haven't. Is it is that um, is that a five millimeter device or is it? Uh, is there any other three millimeters out there? That's what I'm. I'd be really keen on trying. I want to say the my seal. I haven't used it personally, so please. I think it is. I think it's more. Um, commonly used in Europe. So if any of our European friends are on there, they can comment, but it's, I want to say it's a steam sterilizable one, which is why it's very popular, um, but it hasn't uh, made it over, over the pond in a big way. I think that's the one I'm talking about, but I have no personal experience of it. Yeah, it's a, it's a thermal sealer, but it can be re-sterilized. Um, and it's similar to the harmonic in that you can dissect and seal at the same time, meaning it's not with a blade necessarily. I have no experience uh, using it, but um, have just seen, uh, I guess, advertisements and discussions of the device. Along the same lines, is anyone who's using the new ligature handles for extensive dissection having issues with premature firing with the purple button moved to the inside of the handle as opposed to the back of the handle? And do you have thoughts or suggestions to avoid it? I, I can't comment on that one because I still have the old handles. I think I'd have trouble if I had to change yeah, I haven't, I haven't had that problem, um, but I, I don't remember. Yeah, I can't really comment on that. The, the thing that's 
striking to me is how expensive those handles have become. And just in the last two, three, four years, we really need more competition in our marketplace for, with those. I mean, they're sort of um, seven to nine hundred dollars a piece now on the in the U.S. Yeah, agreed. They're way too expensive. Um, back to I mean, back to the ports and losing insufflation. Have you tried working with the balloon ports? I, I yeah, I've I've seen those. I know a lot of people are using those ports. I I should try those. Uh, you know, I I don't know if if um, if that would be good in in cats if they make some smaller sizes. But yeah, they might be helpful in those. Yeah. Yeah, that's from Applied Medical, I think, that kind of portals. Um, it works very fine in small animals or cushion it with a very thin uh, abdominal wall. Um, sadly, here are uh, expensive. Too much oh, expensive for cool. all of our surgeries. But great stuff. I, I like so much that the, the kind of portals. Especially in cats and small dogs. All right, thanks. I will definitely check those out. And then, then sorry, Felipe, go ahead. Great, thanks. Um, and then I think we're nearing the and um, does anybody have thoughts on treating pituitary dependent hyperadrenocorticism with bilateral adrenalectomy? I would love to, I would love to try that. And I've spoken to a few people about it. We had an endocrinologist here who left, unfortunately, who was keen, um, although he was keener on hypophysectomy for those cases. Um, so we never, we never got it going. But I, I think taking out normal adrenals would be a pretty quick um, and and pretty low morbidity thing to do. Uh, I think those uh, internal medicine colleagues do a pretty good job with their medical management. And so they don't think about it. It's an education thing, uh, but it'd be a super interesting study to compare those two um, if, if hypophysectomy wasn't, you know, available, which is not in most, most centers. I, I think it's a very good alternative uh, when the transphenoidal approaches with navigation are not available. Uh, we have a few cases, two cases uh, of bilateral uh, adrenalectomy for that. Uh, with good results, but it's very, it's very important, it's important to have a, a partner, partner in or, uh, endocrinologist partner for the follow up patients. That's a very good alternative. But um, Felipe, in the ones you've done, good results. In the in the in the few cases that you've done, you've had good results. Very good results, yeah. Cool. I'll we'll have to try it. Yeah, it's very easy, and uh, the outcome of patients are just fine. Uh, they need uh, a close follow up, but. Uh, we have a very good uh, experience in, in, in that procedure, but we just um, performed three of that, two cases. Yeah, I, sp I spoke to our medicine group about that. Actually, I think maybe just the end of last year. I think the trouble is, is that, you know, how do you get... Um, you know, how do you get the owners on board for that versus, you know, what they're doing right now? At least that's what our, that's what our internists kind of, they weren't pushing back by any means. Our, our IM group's great, very progressive, uh, but you know, it's tough. Like what, how, how are you going to make that play? I guess you say, Hey, this is, this is not going to be, uh, you know, potentially as long of a treatment course is that is that the you know the advantage because you're they're still going to have to get treated for um, you know for for Addison's. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I, I sort of pitched it uh, when I spoke to our crew, I pitched it as a sort of, do you have a population of, of um, challenging, that are, of cases that are just, uh, you know, a real challenge to man manage medically. But I think, I think I, I don't know if that was sort of truer in the days of Lysadrin and it's less true now in the days of Triadostain and stuff. I, I, I don't know if there's a, you know, I, I, I didn't get the impression, although I didn't pursue it aggressively, I didn't get the impression that there was this, highly significant population of cases out there that that internists are tearing their hair out over um but i but you know that's um that's not a highly scientifically validated observation so i i should try that on 10 different internists and see if i get anybody to bite all right um I think that we have come to the end of our discussion. It was really, really good. And uh, thank you all for the really interesting talks and really interesting discussion. Do we have any last minute announcements that we need or? The, uh, Michelle uh, Washak did raise her hand. I don't know if she does wanna ask a question, um, but I did switch it so that uh, you can talk Michelle if you want. Nope, I think I'm going to hit it back for that. <laughs> Sounds good, no worries. All right, thanks everybody. Thanks for your attention and we'll uh, see you at the next one. Thanks everyone, take care. Bye. Thanks Kelly, Bye. Chris, Felipe, Phil. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Take care.